July brings a new slate of state laws and a litany of additional issues across the state. We get an update from Iowa reporters on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, July 16 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. The month of July begins a new fiscal year for the state of Iowa and new laws going into effect on July 1st. Iowans are also keeping watchful eyes on the state budget and ongoing drought and recent headlines about water quality. To check the pulse of Iowa issues, we've gathered a reporter's roundtable. Perry Beeman covers state government and Iowa issues for the Capitol Dispatch. Aaron Murphy is Des Moines Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises. And Kay Henderson is News Director at Radio Iowa. Perry, welcome to the show. This is Thank your you. debut appearance. That's right. You've worked in Iowa journalism for a long time at the Register and the Business Record. What, tell us what the Capital Dispatch is. So we're a nonprofit online news uh, operation, and we cover state government, public policy, things like that. Great. Well, we're glad to have you. Thank you. I want to go around the table, start with you, Kay. What's the mood of Iowa? What are you seeing, sensing, feeling out there about Iowa? Well, business owners are worried about hiring. Farmers are worried about the crops. A little bit of rain makes people happy and the upcoming football season is making people really happy. So the mood is sort of perking up. Why, okay, right, because we can legally drink in Iowa City? You know? <laughs> Harry, what are you hearing? What? Well, I think, I think the mood is upbeat. I mean, I think because we're kind of emerging a little bit out of the pandemic, some of us have the vaccinations, and so things are much more active. The business people are optimistic, even though they are having these workforce issues. And Aaron? Yeah, if, if the recent 4th of July holiday is any indication, people are excited to be out and enjoying summer to the fullest. Again, um, my neighborhood, at least anecdotally, was <laughs> was awash with fireworks. So uh, as, as Perry said, we're emerging from the pandemic, and I think it's a kind of a natural time. We're going into the summer months, too. So I, I think it's a generally positive mood out there. Right. Um, I want to start into some issues. I want our, our viewers to understand that we're taping this show on July 9th just to accommodate schedules. Perry, I'll start with you. Water quality has been your forte for years as a reporter. Reports uh, seem to be getting worse about the quality of Iowa's water. Yeah, and I think we're in a position where in the last 40 years, we've done a good job of cutting down on sewage pollution, pollution from pipes, you know, the end of pipe type of pollution from factories. But on the ag side, we're having some challenges. The University of Iowa says that one of the key components of pollution from crops has doubled in recent years. So we have a lot of work to do. Okay, is there legislation in the works to do something about this? Well, interestingly, as Governor Kim Reynolds signed a budget bill near a lake in north central Iowa last year, she mentioned that, you know, next year people will be back at the state house talking about spending money on water quality. And let's not forget that um, before the pandemic hit, she was proposing something she called the Invest in Iowa plan, which uh, raised the sales tax, reduced other taxes, but dedicated uh, not exactly a boatload, but a lot of money toward water quality. So I would expect her to make a proposal in terms of spending more state resources on water quality projects, incentives. Mm -hmm. Aaron, we're hearing a lot about a thing called carbon sequestration out of the farm community as a way to clean up 
our environment. What do you explain this? Yeah, so that's gaining a little more traction. Uh, you're hearing people like Republican Senator Chuck Grassley talking about it. It's taking cropland out of production and instead uh, putting in clamp plants that will help capture carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, and, and there's talk about using the government to incentivize those kinds of programs. Already we have critics of that type of program though too, the calling it just a cash grab for farmers because there's uh, some disagreement over the extent to which that is helpful to the overall uh, solution. Perry, are we any closer in Iowa to getting a resolution to, to, to this problem, the legislation, these ideas that float around? I mean, this issue, this has been an issue for a long time. Are we getting any closer to some kind of resolution? Um, you know, I think there's, a, on the water quality yeah. in general, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of collaboration going on. There are a lot of task forces. There are a lot of uh, attempts to collaborate. There, of course, was the famous lawsuit with, with Water Works that, that was dismissed. Um, I think we're getting closer in the sense that there are some small demonstration projects and maybe more of them, but it's the scale of this problem that, that really makes it seem insurmountable at times. Okay. Kit, um, Perry just mentioned the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit, which I believe was in 2017. Is that when it was, Perry? I think it's um, right. Uh, but, you know, recently there's been another um, lawsuit that was brought by a, a different coalition, and it was dismissed by the Iowa Supreme Court, and the court was fairly specific in its ruling that this is not something for the courts to resolve. This is something for elected officials to resolve. So they've thrown it to the legislature and to the executive branch to come up with solutions. Um, so I would not expect um, the, the court fight to be where this is waged. This is going to be focused now on policymakers. Aaron, urban-rural split? Yeah, and, and it always uh, eventually comes back to mandatory versus um, uh, voluntary participation in, in some of these programs. So it, I, that, it, that is usually at the heart of all of these debates and whether ag producers should be required to do s some things versus incentivized to do some things. And, and that, that debate has never settled itself. And that's why we kind of just see baby steps to, to Perry's point. There's, there's a lot of things happening, but it's, it's on a smaller scale than what we need to ultimately tackle this. Perry, here in Des Moines, they're talking about spending millions of dollars on trails and, and, and activities along uh, the Des Moines River. If the river is so dirty, why are they spending all this money and time fixing this thing up? Right. Well, the backers of that project will tell you they are trying to address the water quality at the same time. But let's just say the Des Moines River is a very large watershed, so that's a very large task. Uh, there are certain activities like kayaking where you may not be at much risk. You're not drinking a lot of water, you're not getting a lot of it on you. But if you're going to be swimming, things like that, you'd have to take some precautions, right? So I think that they are aware that that's an issue and it will be an issue. It's a $120 million project in central Iowa and all of those streams need so, some work. So it's okay to kayak, but just don't drink the water while you're doing it. That would be a bad <laughs> idea. Aaron, let's switch gears. Another big issue. The surplus, the state surplus, the revenue estimating conference uh, issues a forecast. The state has come in and said, no, it's better than that. Yeah, and this was pretty remarkable. Um, the LSA, the, which is the state agency nonpartisan uh, that analyzes and crunches these numbers, said, uh, and, and now granted we're coming out of a pandemic year, but that the growth was actually 19%, which is um, just amazing that the state revenues are going to surpass $81 billion. So I, I wrote down some words here. My, my colleague um, and, and partner in crime at the Gazette, Rod Beauchart, reported on this for us, and, and he talked to someone from LSA. And these are wonks, analyst types. These aren't people normal, normally prone to hyperbole. And the quote, words from the quotes in that story were shocking, impressive and really odd. So this is a, a, a pretty remarkable situation we're in and, and when legislators, legislators come back to do their work on their next budget, they're gonna have a lot of money to play around with. For the first time, the state collected more than $10 billion in overall revenue in the just concluded year. Uh, and it had a half a billion dollar surplus. And what that sets Republican legislators and a Republican governor up for is income tax cuts. The governor, when she signed, as we've mentioned on the show previously in mid-June, a series of 
personal income tax cuts, getting eventually rid of the state inheritance tax and some other tax changes, said we're going to be back next year and we're going to cut taxes. She's going to cut, she's going to propose reductions in personal income taxes. Uh, Aaron, w were the revenue estimates being intentionally lowballed by the politicians so they could have this good cheery news and come back and cut taxes? Mm -hmm. So, or was there, was there an error in this forecasting? I, you know, uh, your first question is a fair question, and, and I don't know the answer to that, and I think that's a fair question to put to the, to the people on that panel. Why, why were you so far off? But I will say one, one thing that did play in this and what some analysts have said is um, sales tax, for example, was higher than expected. They thought maybe the pandemic would suppress spending, and that didn't happen, and the federal stimulus may have assisted that, you know, the Fed sent direct checks to to all Americans and they were able to spend that money um, out in the economy and that may have made things a little rosier than otherwise would have happened. And it's not a big chunk of revenue, but corporate taxes were up, I think, of 52%. Kay, when they set up the revenue estimating conference, they did so because they wanted to get accurate estimates. And they, mm -hmm. Politicians agreed, we'll have all the experts and we'll get good accurate estimates. We'll fight over how we spend it or cut taxes, but we'll get accurate estimates. Are those days gone? This was an error. What if that error was in the other direction that we were we'd be having a, short? We'd be having a special session and legislators would be back in town cutting uh, state agencies, perhaps reducing, if it was in the magnitude of half a billion dollars, they'd be cutting um, state payments to public school districts. You think there's any thought being given to trying to look at how these revenue estimating models are working so they're not an error well, next time? Uh, as Aaron mentioned, odd was one of the words that was used in Rod Beauchart's story in the Cedar Rapids Gazette. And I, I think that part of the um, answer to the question may be, I don't know this, but things got so low last time around and then they messed around or changed. Uh, the, the deadlines for paying your taxes, and then they were reported in different years in different ways. And so uh, this is, it's hard to compare apples and oranges here, I think. And so I think that was part of what the, what the problem was. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I, I would add, and to circle back, you know, the quotes that I cited, that was, that was not from a member of the estimating panel, that was an quotes from a, a guy whose job is to crunch these numbers. That's what he does 365, 24, 7, and he was baffled by this. So, okay. it's, just, it's worth mentioning from a policy standpoint that this kind of money means, to the Republicans, means another chance to cut taxes, and I think that's what they would like to do. To the Democrats and others, it, it, it means, are we spending enough money on, on mental health, on child care, on the environment, and these other things that have have needed more funding. But between the stimulus money that's pouring into this state and these new windfall revenues, everybody's happy. You can cut taxes and you can increase spending. <laughs> Let the good times roll. You could, although I don't think the GOP really wants to increase spending. It's more of a focus is on the tax cuts, and I think we'll see more proposals. Okay, switch gears. Pandemic reporting is being changed. The way the state provides data uh, to us about the pandemic. What's happening here? Well, if you go online and you click on the Iowa Department of Public Health, um, for the past year or so, there have been a series of charts and reports, and you can see um, how many people have been vaccinated in Iowa. You can see where there are outbreaks at long-term care facilities, um, and you can see uh, the number of Iowans that are hospitalized for treatment of COVID. Um, that is only going to be updated on a weekly basis from now on, and eventually that data will go away, number one. Uh, number two, the long-term care uh, reporting is, is going away more quickly. Um, so the other thing that I will add is that it's been really difficult for people who look at this data to compare it with data that's being collected on a national level by um, the New York Times, by the CDC, and so Iowans have really had to trust, um, let's say, newspapers and radio stations who are looking at all those sources and trying to figure out what the accurate number is in terms of how many people, what percentage of Iowans have been vaccinated who are eligible, and those sorts of statistics. Aaron, we're, they're doing this, at a, they're providing less information at a time when this Delta variant is yeah. starting to explode. You look at PBS NewsHour, had a 
had a graphic last week showing Iowa in one of the emerging hot spots found in the Midwest. Are they trying to, is the state uh, trying to cover up some bad news? It, it's, it's an interesting time to do this. In, in the state's defense, we are at a point overall in this pandemic where overall numbers have just completely cratered in a, in a positive way. Hardly any cases anymore these days. Hospitalizations are way down, deaths are way down around numbers that we haven't seen since the early days of this pandemic before things really exploded. So, so from that sense, there's a rationale and argument that the state can make that it's no longer necessary to update these numbers four times a day or whatever it is like we do right now. But you raise a very good point. This variant is, is dangerous. Um, Iowa is not as vaccinated as, as some other states. We're about around 60% of, of adults right now, and most public health people would like to see, see that and will tell you they'd like to see that number more around 70 or higher. Um, so, so we're not all the way out of the woods on this yet. Yet. And so taking away that data uh, right now is, is you know, it's, it's fair to question if that's a wise public policy decision. Perry, what would you as a working reporter want to see out of the data the state provides? Well, you want to see, be able to see the trends. And I, I think from day one that the state's information has been uh, unreliable. And I think there has been evidence that the policy has been to make things look better than they are. I mean, we want to be able to tell people what the trends are in all the hospitalizations, how many cases are there, where are the infections, you know, why, why are there hot spots in certain areas, and even specific uh, information requests to the state to sort of beef up some of that data have been rejected in, at times, so. Well, if they thought the pandemic was behind us, there are many in the uh, medical field who say, Hold on to your hat. This Delta variant is going to hit us hard. Aaron, switch gears. We mentioned about uh, federal uh, spending and stimulus. We're now got, we're starting to see some of this uh, uh, federal aid distributed. What's happening there? Yeah, so the governor um, recently announced uh, a, a, another section of the federal stimulus package, which will go directly to city governments for their use. And that's just kind of this ongoing um, spigot in many ways of, of this relief funds that uh, states are going to have at their disposal. Now local governments are going to have at their disposal too. They've been planning for this. They've been expecting it. Um, so they're getting ready to, 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 to devise ways to use all this. And, and it's going to be interesting to see what all these local governments uh, put this funding towards what you know whether it's their infrastructure or, or public health programs whatever it may be uh, they're gonna have a lot of money at their disposal you know we had a couple of mayors on the program maybe a month ago from Johnston and I and Cedar Rapids and you know what they said and what we're hearing from other city and county officials is that they can use this money to plug holes in their budget so, number one, it could mean that property taxes won't go up as much as that might otherwise. Uh, number two, they tend to use these monies for infrastructure projects. So, you know, if there's no infrastructure deal at the end of infrastructure week in, in the nation's capital, uh, there, at least, you know, some pot hill, potholes may be filled and some um, sewage plants may be improved with this money at the city and county level. Harry, do Republicans have a point? Some Republicans in Washington say things are going along pretty well. Uh, we don't need to spend any more stimulus money. You look at the state budget, you know, all this money coming in from the feds. Uh, do they have a point that we've got plenty of stimulating going on? I mean, I think you could you could make that point. I think it's a valid point. I mean, when when do you stop, right? But there are also needs like the Des Moines Airport needs a new terminal. It's you know, which is a gigantic project, and some of the sewage treatment, water treatment you mentioned, even the roads. There are, are a lot of needs. But yes, Iowa is in good shape financially. Was before the pandemic, still is, and so it becomes a question of how much do you spend. And that's actually a good point, just to, to tack onto this, David. Infrastructure is a whole nother spending package that still could be coming, that will help cities with their roads, and bridges, and whatever. That, that that's not even a part of this yet, and that could be coming down the pipeline too. And that money that's coming from the pandemic relief funds that have been approved by the Trump and the Biden administrations, and perhaps this infrastructure package means that state legislators won't have to raise the gas tax 
um, anytime soon because they're going to have this influx of money for the transportation system at the same time that they're seeing um, you know cars get more efficient more electric cars that is getting pushed down the road that decision well and there's always a danger with this much money coming in this quickly which we've never seen before that somehow there's going to be money that's misspent it's just uh, the capacity of governments to spend this kind of money wisely um, is limited and we'll, we'll, I guarantee you we'll all be doing you all will be doing stories about this boondoggle or this waste that uh, uh, is happening. Perry, I want to switch gears, uh, talk a little politics. How's, how's the governor doing? Kim Reynolds uh, looks like she's run for re-election. What's your sense of her prospects? Well, I, I think if you're, if you're a conservative, she's done very well. The tax cuts, the, she has stayed pretty close to the Brandstad approach to things and, and, and now her approach to things. If you're a Democrat, she's done almost nothing right. You know, hasn't spent enough on some key issues, and uh, and is just heading in a completely different policy direction. Kay, how do you think she's? Doing? Well, the problem for Democrats who are criticizing Kim Reynolds is there's just no single yeah. candidate emerging as the challenger for her yet. They're, they may have a spirited primary. Uh, they may have several candidates run, and indeed probably will, but. As yet, no one has emerged as that singular voice to challenge her on these policies. And, and the one thing I'll add, I, I think Perry is exactly right. She's basically governed in a way that your Republicans and conservatives are going to be firmly behind her and your liberals and Democrats are going to be firmly against her no matter what. So you talk about where, where, what few of those remain, those middle-of-the-road voters, those undecided voters. And I will say the governor has put her dipped her toes in just enough water that she has a message for those people. She can say she, she, Kay talked about the water quality. She made a big proposal on water quality. Didn't happen, but she can pin that on the legislature. She made the proposal. She has been a leader on criminal justice reform. Um, she took care of the felon voting uh, rights issue through an executive order, and she's proposed even more that, again, the legislature didn't come up. So she has done enough of, of those kinds of issues that she can take that message on the campaign trail, too, and talk to those voters who aren't, don't have their heels dug into one side or the other and might be willing to listen to work she's done. And on I think topics. you have to add mental health to that list of things Absolutely. that she's tried to push hard. Yep. Well, to be continued. Um, Kay, uh, 2024. Oh, you bet. Never ends in Iowa, does it? Exactly. It's How do the, the Republicans look? It's the perpetual <laughs> campaign. We've had, you know, both senators named Scott here. Um, we've had a lot of other folks. Nikki Haley, the former U.N. ambassador, was here in June. And, and we're going to have more folks uh, throughout the year uh, who have their eyes on the White House. Um, but all of this is sort of happening in a sense of... Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, jiggly jello because they're not breaking out yet because no one knows whether Donald Trump will be running for another term uh, next time around until he makes an announcement what he's doing. I think that sort of freezes the race a little bit. Um, but it also probably um, will engage some people to come to Iowa to campaign who have their eyes on being his running mate because it's for sure he's not going to have Mike Pence as his running mate again. We've got just a couple minutes quickly, Aaron. A special session is in the offing. What are they going to do? The, the primary test, the reason they're coming back is to finish off the redistricting process. We've had this federal census data delayed by the pandemic, population numbers to figure out our political boundaries for the next 10 years. The open-ended question, and we don't have an answer for this yet, is what other issue might sneak in there. They don't have to do just redistricting. They could also take up another tax cut bill. Transgender athlete bans they've talked about, maybe they get that bill done instead. Why wouldn't they do those things in a normal way till uh, election year? <laughs> voters, you do something for the, voters now, they could forget before they go to the polls. You do an election year. They'll have plenty to do <laughs> next year, too. Perry, real quickly, ethanol. Big fights over ethanol? Yeah, I think we're just in for a really interesting debate. The ethanol uh, industry was upset with President Trump. They're upset with President Biden. Electric vehicles are coming. So the question is, how long will this industry that uses half of our corn crop exist in the current form? What's your answer to that question? What's, what, what are they gonna, how do they reinvent themselves? Well, well, they could reinvent the plants to make other types of alcohol long term, but I think in the short term, the short term could be five or ten years, they will continue to produce ethanol and, and they will 
try to keep their markets. Okay. Uh, the other thing they can do is uh, use corn fiber to make products that are now being made out of petroleum, like material and plastic. Try to do, try to move into that space. This, this strikes me as a real emerging policy issue for Iowa, uh, with the moving to electric cars. What, the, Aaron, is there a future for ethanol? Yeah, I, I think that's kind of the, the, the big picture view here that the industry needs to have, and I'm sure recognizes this, is this, this doesn't have a future 20, yeah. 30, 40 years, whatever it is, is down the road, and that's why these other things are, are, are avenues that they need to be pursuing. We're out of time. Thanks to all of you, and welcome to Thank the you. show, Perry. We'll be back in two weeks for another edition of Iowa Press. We'll be off next week while the Iowa PBS sports crew brings you live coverage of the Iowa High School Girls State Softball Championships. So for all of us here at Iowa PBS, I'm David Yepsen. Thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.